what would be the difference of building a decentralized indexer uh, for Bitcoin versus, we'll say, Ethereum? Is it easier to do with smart contract functionality, or is there the same issues no matter what you're doing when it comes to decentralized indexers? I think we have the same issues there because all of the indexers right now are like Web2 indexers. They aren't using smart contracts or anything else. Having an indexer that is decentralized makes a lot more sense. I don't really know how Bitcoin indexers are built currently, but I think we have the same kind of issues that we have to tackle to decentralize the indexer. And what are those issues that you're facing, uh, at least from your perspective? Yeah, firstly, for right now, I can't say much because I've been reading through ICP documentation a <laughs> lot. <laughs> I'm still trying to figure out how ICP works, but I think I'll have like a ton of issues that come up. ICP is quite good, but also it's quite new and building on it will have its own challenges. We haven't really started building it. We're trying to figure out what's the best place to build it on. So let's see. EScription, Polyscriptions, BNB scriptions, inscriptions. It's scriptions all the way down the board. And I'm very excited to have this conversation today with my friend Shardul, who has been leading the charge for Polyscriptions and BNB scriptions. If you've been living under a rock, then you may not know what this is, but it's a new way to store data on different types of blockchains, whether you're doing proof of work chains with Bitcoin or some proof of stake chains like like uh, Polygon, BNB, Escriptions. It's quite interesting how it's all unfolded. And I had to bring Shardul on here, who is the recent founder of EVM.inc, which is a, an aggregator for the Escriptions, Polyscriptions, BNB Scriptions. Who knows? Maybe there's some other ones that are being built behind <laughs> the scenes. So Shardul, man, thanks for, for coming on the show. Thank you for having me. Yeah, I really appreciate it. I also love the background. Looks really good, really clean. Uh, you know, just, just to get this whole thing started, we, you know, we started chatting maybe two, three months ago when Escriptions uh, started taking off, and you were pretty quick to the scene within probably a few weeks to say, "Hey, can Emblem yeah. Vault, you know, build a curated collection for Polyscriptions?" And BB inscriptions, and I was like, "Wait, what? what? What do you mean?" And he's like, "I've already built this out on on these other chains," so, and I didn't even realize this. But now thinking back, thinking retroactively about it, makes complete sense. First, tell us a little bit about about yourself, man. What brought you into this space, and and kind of a little bit about your background? So I've been in the space since like 2013. I I found out about Bitcoin in 2012, 2013, and then I was like, "Let's let's see what." All the, what is it about? And uh, it was a friend that introduced me to it. I know in India, we didn't really have a robust infrastructure to do online payments. So I was trying to figure out how do I do an online payment? And then someone was like, hey, you know, there's this new currency called Bitcoin and you can probably do an online payment with it. So I was like, sure, let me just look into it. So I started looking into it and I was like, okay, how do I get my hands on this? And the only way to get my hands on it was like mine it. So I tried mining Bitcoin on my laptop and then it just fried my laptop in like a few days. But it stuck with me. So I was like, let's let's look into it a lot more and let's see how Bitcoin actually evolves over time. And over the next two years, I just I was just watching it. I didn't really do much. And then I, I was like, let's let's go all in on this. Let's start mining Bitcoin full time. So I ordered like ASIC miners. I started mining Bitcoin in like 2015, 2016. And and then it just I, I just couldn't handle the whole maintenance of the miner. I think I could do like better things there. So I was like all right, this phase is done. Let's move on. And I've been, I'm from a technical background. And so I was like, whenever I explained someone Bitcoin, they were like, how do we buy some? So the main idea was why not just create an exchange? Why not just create something like local Bitcoin, but like for the area, the specific local Bitcoin. And so I went to do that. And I, I did the first one in Malaysia first. I did it for Bitcoin and then I did it for Ethereum. And that I ran that for like six to eight months. Right after that, regulation kicked in, the ICO thing started, and <laughs> I had to shut that down. And then I moved into services. I was like, hey, okay, I'm quite young right now. I was like 24 at the time. And I was like, okay, let's, let's try something else. And probably I don't know everything. So why not just get into Bitcoin? Why not just get into like development? Like why not learn from other people who've done this over, over a large period of time? because it's, it's a business at the end of the day and you got to learn it. So we got into development. It was me and my team. We got into development. We did a lot of development for like, 
we built exchanges for people, we built ICO platforms, we went ahead and then started doing smart contract development. We made a lot of NFT marketplaces over the years in like 2020, where people wanted their own NFT marketplaces. So from that time, I've just been in the space full time. And recently, when the bear market hit, we were like, hey, this is the best time to actually build something of our own. We know a lot of things now, and why not just try building things on our own. So that's where we came up with the concept of Friday Wallet. Like you mentioned, Friday Wallet is a wallet that is targeted to first-time crypto users. It does not need you to have like, it does not need you to have a phone. It does not need you to have a wallet address. It does not need you to have anything. There is a wallet address in the background. All you need is a phone number and that's about it. You can put in your phone number, get a wallet address. You can send money to anyone just with their phone number, just with their email address, or just with like, a username. And yes, there is a centralized aspect to it, but how many people care about centralization that aren't in crypto? Right now, everyone in Web3, yes, even I I care about decentralization. But the minute you go speak to someone who's not in the space and try to explain them decentralization, they're like, they just don't care about it, but they want to get in. And there is no better way to get in in crypto just by simplifying the process because you have two hurdles, which is like user behavior. And the second one is just the learning curve. And people can get into MetaMask. They can like first figure out, okay, MetaMask, there is like a 12, 12 word phrase that they have to keep at some place. First question is, hey, why don't I have a username? What's the password for? If I have a password, why do I have to save all of these 12 words? So we were like, okay, let's just say that is not of any need. Let's let's just make a wallet that is plain and simple. People can just enter a phone number and send money to each other. That's about it. This will be powered by crypto, obviously stable coins as of right now, because when we saw a lot of countries that were experiencing hyperinflation, the best bet for them is the dollar. It's not really Bitcoin for them. It's the dollar right now. Even though the world is going through de-dollarization or whatever we can, we, you want to call it, dollar is probably their best bet to survive their economy. So we were like, sure, let's go ahead and build a wallet of this sort. And we've been doing this for a while now. This took us, this took us like six months to build. And right now it's out and live and people are using it. There are just a few people using it right now. And we're still building on Friday. Hey. And then it's just that I figured out the place to be to do something of this sort is is Twitter. And so I got on Twitter like three months ago and I started tweeting. I was trying to figure out Twitter and I was like, okay, let's let's tweet and let's see how what kind of a response we get. And while doing that, the DJ in me was like, hey, what is PRC20? And I looked at Bitcoin NFTs at first. I, I remember the whole punk days. I downloaded like the Sparrow wallet. I also looked at I also looked at all of these stacks NFTs at the time. And I was like, wow, this is so cool. Like people are actually bringing NFTs to Bitcoin. And so I I looked at BRC20. I, I claimed all the BRC20s that came out at the time. I was like, wow, this is really cool. And this works in a very, this works in a very different way than how smart contracts really work. So I was like, sure, this is cool, but I don't have a bandwidth to like start building on Bitcoin right now. And then I saw inscriptions come out. And when I saw inscriptions come out, instantly just something went off in my brain. I was like, hey, we can build the same thing on every EVM chain out there. And core, core focus is actually the indexer. It's not really the protocol, it's the indexer. And if we can actually build an indexer that speaks to other indexers, that would be so cool. And that was the main idea for like doing the inscription platform. Yep. So and all of this just points to EVM Inc. right now since we've aggregated all of it to one platform. This looks actually pretty clean from, from when we had first spoke about BNB scriptions. It was a little bit chaotic on the on the page. Yeah. But I've now pulled up EVM.inc, which aggregates again eScriptions, polyscriptions, and BNB scriptions. So before we do dive into EVM.inc though. When it comes to, you know, storing information in the call data, things like polyscription or BNB scriptions or eScriptions, what what benefits do you find from this type of technology that may be beneficial to to users to use this as an alternative for let's say ERC seven twenty one on uh, on Ethereum or whatever the NFT standard is on these other chains? I mean, firstly, it's cheaper. It's much cheaper to do something of this sort. Secondly, these don't really use smart contracts. If you click on something that's an inscription, it's not going to drain your wallet right now. If you're interacting with a smart contract, that might probably drain your wallet, but not an inscription. 
the main thing was when I when I first started building this, it was all about the indexer. The idea was, hey, listen, we need to figure out how an indexer works. We need to figure out if we have indexers on different chains, can they actually speak to each other? And that was the main idea. Go ahead and build a powerful indexer, see what the indexer can do, see what people are doing. And well, let's see what happens to the whole platform right now. How difficult is it to build an indexer? And are you using a different indexer per protocol or is it one that somehow aggregates to the others? No, we're using different indexers for each protocol. Is it difficult to build an indexer? I've heard, at least from the Bitcoin side of everyone who lives in the inscriptions world, that indexers are quite can be it can be quite difficult and take months to build. Yeah, they are quite difficult, but we try to we try to build it really quickly. I think we built it in like three days, and it is quite difficult, but it is quite doable also. There's, there was a lot of material out there that Bitcoin people had put out at the time that we went through, and we were like, okay, this is the fastest way we can create an indexer, and that's what we did. So I mean, it is. A bit difficult, I would say, but obviously not impossible. And I've pulled up here now. You also, there, so there's two sections on evm.inc. There's collections and tokens. Yeah. And this, what I've pulled up here for BNB, it looks like this would be the equivalent of BRC20 or ETH S20 or I guess Polygon 20 or whatever it is. It's This is an interesting UI that you've, that you've built out, very clean to where you can click mint now so you can see that there's you know some activity that's happening but not like a, a crazy amount and what are some of these other ones down here so there you have BEP20 NRC20 is that is is NRC20 on Polygon or is this a different chain oh this one's BNB it has the symbol right next to it oh okay it's on BNB so so what happened was the day we released uh, BNB description and we were just looking at the website we thought people would just upload images we didn't think there would ever be tokens on this <laughs> and suddenly we just see on twitter like someone's posting a token standard for bnb scription and someone's people are don't care about this standard inscribing something else they're inscribing ltc20 if you can look at it they're inscribing <laughs> bnb20 so <laughs> this actually put us in like a huge this this actually was like the worst thing that ever happened we were like okay why are there so many token standards why isn't there just PRC20. Why Why isn't there just like one standard? Indexing that would be so much easier. So then we, we were like, okay, sure. Let's just index all of the tokens because this is what's created by the community. And if an indexer is running, everyone would have to run their own indexer for a certain type of tokens. So why not just index all of it? And that's how we went ahead and indexed everything that looked like a token on all of these chains. And, and I've pulled up here now the docs and it is quite yeah. technically dense. You could see in here, it's got a lot of a lot of the code stuff. So it goes a little bit over my head, but it talks about the- So the if you can see- Good. Yeah, you can see here, it, you, like there were 200 and 256,000 tokens created <laughs> on <laughs> Ethereum. And this was at like when we were at probably 500,000 or around half a million or 750,000. So one third of them were just tokens. And it was the same for BNB. It was the same for Polygon. And this is just, we just had to figure it out. We were like, okay, let's just index all of it. If people are creating it, we, and they're quite easy to index. And if people are creating it, we need to figure out if this is an actual standard. If they think this is a token, why not just index it, have it on the website, let people mint it because there'll be a community around each of these tokens at some point. There'll be someone coming up with their own standard and minting a token. So why not just index it? Make it easier for people to do whatever they want. Just provide maximum amount of flexibility. Yeah, it's funny. You're in the in the documents. It says, it seems you could change the first letter, which, which would be enough for people to think it's new. In reality, it just creates confusion because of bad naming, right? We, we, we make fun of it how... On Bitcoin inscriptions, there's a on, on Bitcoin inscriptions they created BRC20, which was which was borrowed from ERC20. But then on eScriptions, they called it ERC20, which is are there's already an ERC20. So it does cause a lot of confusion that continues that continues on here. So now that we have, you have EVM.inc that's built and you are 
definitely you're aggregating all of the tokens, the token side, because you have SRC20, DRC20, LTC20, which aren't exactly EVM, right? They're proof of work chains. Are there plans for your team to then go add support or even go build out the the inscription side for some of these other EVMs that maybe haven't been attacked yet? Let's say like Avalanche or L2s like Optimism. First, is, is it possible to build on these? And then is EVM Inc. going to then venture to add support for these as well? Yeah, the idea is to have as many chains as possible because like we know l l2 is also just throw data onto ethereum itself and they throw data in like a compressed format we just have to figure out how this data would be interpreted by us or the indexer on the front end so that that really is something that we we got to think about right now but we want to add support for as many chains as possible because what we see is that you can have a recursive inscription across chains so you can have probably something on ethereum and then you could have something else on like polygon that's a part of it and you can have something else on like bsc that is also a part of the main inscription just call it all together and have whatever proof proof ownership with just one of it and i think bitcoin has done like a really great job with like having recursion in inscription ordinals and that really allows people to have like bigger file sizes so if you if you want to like yeah this was me trying to figure out yeah yeah <laughs> this was me trying to figure out recursion so this is the right so, is so, this, so, this, so this so this right this right here is recursion recursive the equivalent of recursive inscriptions on BNB, correct? Yes. yes. Oh, no, this one's on Ethereum, I think. Yeah. Oh, that one took me to... Oh, okay. I, oh, that one's probably on Ethereum. I would say it took me to the, the BSC scan ink. But it, it, oh. it's interesting here because you see BNB inscriptions are already at 142,000 inscriptions, at the equivalent. Now, diving into a little bit of the community, community and participation, since you helped, you know, index and, and build out BNB inscriptions, is this just you and your team inscribing all of these? Is there actual interest from the BNB community in this type of stuff? I think we inscribed only like a hundred of them. We haven't really inscribed anymore. This is just the community coming together and inscribing whatever they want. Yeah, and there's, we've, there is some... We've probably done like 150 of them. Yeah, you can see here, it looks like most of the activity went, was from about a month ago. Yeah. And then it's kind of fizzled out a little bit since then as kind of the markets have really kind of imploded at least the nft markets since where, where yeah i mean when we first started out people wanted punks on all chains they were like hey listen <laughs> this was the first message i received was like we want punks we don't care about anything else get us punks and i was like i don't really think i can do that uh, i think <laughs> i'm not gonna sit down and inscribe ten thousand punks just for people i think you can go do your own punks right now and people just went ahead and inscribed whatever they wanted after that i, I clicked over here yeah. on on one of your drop down menus it says which evm chains would you like us to add support for next as Arbitrum, Avalanche, Optimism. What are these the most requested ones that you've put here? Or are you just trying to fetch ideas? And where what chains do you think are most probabilistic for the EVM dotting team to move into to I add support for? I think optimism. I think optimism, like there have been a lot of requests for optimism. People, this was a question, this was a suggestion by people actually. They came up to us and they were like, hey, listen, we want support for like Optimism, Avalanche, even Pulse Chain. Wow. And we were like, okay, sure. <laughs> and so we put up like a drop down. We put up like a box on the other side and we were like, okay, all right, let's 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 ask people what they actually want. And let's do that next. The focus right now is to like enrich the indexer as much as possible. Try to have an indexer that speaks to like coin side of things and like have more Bitcoin stuff integrated. Because what I think with inscriptions and all of this is ethereum already has a, has smart contracts and we can do a lot of computation on smart contracts and then with recursion we can get stuff back on these proof of work chains that don't have a smart contract language and probably like something is there because that that makes more sense you know you can just prove ownership with bitcoin and do whatever computation you want on ethereum and that that opens up a lot of wide range of possibilities 
people are trying to build on Bitcoin all the time. Yeah, like Lightning is amazing. And then there are like a ton of other people that are doing stuff there. But if we could just get Bitcoin, Ethereum doing Ethereum doing the computation, having proof on Bitcoin. I mean, I, I think that sounds cool. So that's what I'm going to probably try next. Is it is it tough to keep up with all these different protocols? Because as I scroll down through tokens, you have <laughs> ERC-20, ORC-20, then there's E. Uh, EBRC20, and then as we know on Bitcoin, there's there's got to be at least 50 different standards that have popped up since then. How do you go about like vetting which type of protocol is the right one to add, or are you literally just adding everything that pops up under the sun? We we just add everything that pops up under the sun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you even got you got E E E20. It, yeah. I guess maybe add to a little bit of explanation for maybe the the non tech savvy people what is the difference between all of these different protocols if they exist on a different type of blockchain like for example on ethereum there's erc20 there's ebrc20 there's i think ethia eths20 e20 why esc20 why why are there so many different protocols here what, what is going on people have created it so we've indexed it it's as simple as that people came up and created their own tokens anything that looks like a token you change the JSON that is there and you can create your own standard. It's that simple right now. So whatever the community has created a token for, we've just indexed all of it. Yeah, and, you, and I'm but seeing- Currently, we've, we've changed stuff. So if you can actually go to like creating an inscription, I don't know if your wallet's connected, but if you can create an inscription, they, we ask you if you want to create a token. And now we've, you can create, click create, and it'll ask you, Ah. If you want to create a chip token, yeah. So now you can create a coin right here. And this is what we've done to standardize that process where we're like, hey, okay, let's just have BNB20 or whatever it's called. Let's just have one type of standard. Instead of giving people a text box and letting them inscribe whatever they want, let's give them like specific fields that they can enter right now and just click one button and deploy. And this is actually something that has reduced the amount of BRC20, E20, or like <laughs> EBRC20. Yeah, this is quite simple and much needed in the world of crypto where UX and, and UI yeah. tends to be quite quite horrible. What what are the trends yeah. that you're seeing then from, from the back end? What is getting the most traction? Is it Polygon, BNB, Ethereum? Is it the tokens? Is it, or the tokens? Is it the images? What, what are you seeing? So I would say tokens are up there. And obviously Ethereum has a ton of traffic right now. Everyone loves Ethereum. People are just deploying stuff on Ethereum left, right, and center. Polygon, uh, BNB would be next, and then it's Polygon. So Ethereum, for some reason, people are just creating stuff on it all the time. And there is a lot of activity happening on Ethereum. And what, what about non-EVM smart contract platforms? Like, we'll, we'll say like Solana, is there is there a possibility to, to create something like this on Solana and then for EVM yeah. to aggregate? Yes. So we are looking into non-EVM chains. One of them was Cosmos that we looked into recently. And they have, the issue with Cosmos, I think so that we had recently was they have the call data right now in Ethereum is 100 KB. So you can store a lot of stuff in 100 kilobytes. But for Cosmos, it's literally 50 bytes. So if you have to do anything on Cosmos, it has to be through a recursion standard. We have to create a standard for recursion where you can actually have stuff on Cosmos or do something on Cosmos. So yeah, we, we are looking into non-EVM chains. Solana is one of them. Solana has, I think, so a lot more space than Ethereum. Mm -hmm. So that is much easier to do. But we want to, we want to index every chain out there. And we want the indexer to be more decentralized. Currently, I think even in Bitcoin, the issue that is happening is everyone's running their own indexer. And there is no way to request an indexer for a certain protocol. And I think that needs to change. That is something that really needs to change. We need to, we need to be able to get some kind of consensus between indexers. And that makes it even more decentralized. We, and I've been looking at ICP and a few more cloud decentralized computing platforms for that. And ICP really caught my eye on something of that sort. So I think we're going to move the whole index or stack to ICP and get, build the whole thing there. 
Yeah, you're, you're going to have to talk to, to Bob Bodily, who I had on the podcast. He's kind of leading the decentralized inscriptions on Bitcoin movement. And, and ICP is one of the suggested platforms to, to build the decentralized indexer on. I believe the other two is Stacks, and then there's another one that Domo has also been exploring. But those are for for inscriptions on Bitcoin. Bitcoin is right; it's a non-Turing complete. There's you know partial smart contracts, but it has to go through side chains, and you can't do it directly on chain. Whereas EVM, right? EVM chains have smart contracts. How, what 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 would be the difference of building a decentralized indexer uh, for Bitcoin versus, we'll say, Ethereum? Is it, is it easier to do with smart contract functionality, or do, is there the same issues no matter what you're doing when it comes to decentralized indexers? I think we have the same issues there because all of the indexers right now are like Web2 indexers. They aren't using smart contracts or any kind of... They're not using anything else. So having an indexer that is decentralized makes a lot more sense, and I think... I don't really know how Bitcoin indexers are built currently, but I think we have the same kind of issues that we have to tackle to decentralize the indexer. And what and what are those issues that you're facing, uh, at least from firstly, your pers- from your perspective? Yeah, firstly, for right now, I can't say much because I've been reading through ICP documentation a lot. <laughs> <laughs> I'm still trying to figure out how ICP works, but I think I think I'll have like a ton of issues that come up. ICP is quite is quite good, but also it's quite new. You know, and building on it will have its own challenges. We haven't really started building it. We're trying to figure out what's the best place to build it on. So let's see. Yeah, the, the decentralized, I actually had no idea what an indexer yeah. was until I started dabbling around uh, with Bitcoin and people kept uh, discussing what the, mm-hmm. the issues are with, with indexers and basically creating your own rules of governance to interpret this type of data from the blockchain. And that's how you get inscriptions and inscriptions, stuff like that. But, but kind of like, you know, scaling out, looking at the larger picture, is there an actual business opportunity here will this ever move from something that's just experimentation into something that you know garners thousands or tens of thousands of users and then actually has some sort of utility outside of speculation yeah for sure so again going back to the indexer part i think having an indexer that is a multi-chain indexer is something we're looking for because once you have an indexer you don't really need bridges if you have an open protocol you can actually transfer money from one chain to another. It doesn't matter if it's Bitcoin, it doesn't matter if it's Solana. You can just have a cross-chain transfer and the indexer just keeps track of everything and you're good. So the biggest attack vector right now in Web3 are bridges. And if this solves the problem of just removing bridges, we're good, you know? Bridges are just like modified multi-sig. So instead of having a bridge, why don't we just have indexers? And if we can actually move from like the ERC-20 token standard to like somehow convert these ERC-20 tokens to an inscription and then move them across chains, we're much safer right now. Last year alone, we had like $2 billion in bridge hacks that have happened. So I think exploring the space a lot more and having like a multi-chain approach, we might actually have a lot of utility going forward. That's actually the first time I've really heard that that idea articulated that an indexer could be a solution, a decentralized indexer can be a solution to bridges. You know, I work at Emblem Vault and we're not a bridge, but we're kind of in the same kind of fields, same, same kind of ideas. If you do take this decentralized indexer, you know, which could take a while to build, does it then also reduce the amount of gas fees that can be used, right? Because that's the main issue on, on Ethereum is that users hate minting nfts because when gas fees you know get over 100 guay you're paying you know 100 bucks to mint an nft of some sort would it would a decentralized indexer be a solution to you know these growing gas fees in times of high congestion the solution that an indexer really brings is a decentralized multi-chain indexer that brings to the table is you can do whatever on whatever chain you want and you can reference it on a completely different chain so if you want to mint like an nft why think about what chain it has to be minted on? Do it on probably BNB, do it on whatever chain you want. Doesn't matter gas fees. If gas fees is high, just don't use Ethereum. You can reference it back to Ethereum at a later stage. So instead of trying to think about Ethereum gas fees, and this is the only reason we want to index every chain out there, because you should always have an option to move to another chain and then just reference it back to Ethereum. And that's the idea. So 
I don't think gas fees would reduce, but I think using other chains and then referencing it back to Ethereum at a later stage is a solution for something of this sort. Yeah, I, I'm going to use the word m- multi-scriptions, I guess, which could be you know supplemental for multi-chain inscriptions. So if you do have the, because I think it is kind of a really fascinating idea as I, I'm under a big belief that where crypto is going is this kind of multi-chain future. Could you, could you have, if you, if you built this multi-chain or inscription tool, could you have inscription, basically recursive inscriptions across multiple chains referencing one another? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I think I sent you, I think I sent you one of those on Twitter. I was like, Hey, take a look at this. It had an image. It had one inscription, which was from Ethereum, one inscription that was from BNB and another one from Polygon. And they were all just referenced onto Ethereum at, at a later stage. So you can literally click on them and see every inscription, every element of that inscription is on a different chain. Right now, like Bitcoin is the gold, you would call it, like the gold in the crypto market. But you will also have jewelry that is gold and silver. You'll also have jewelry that is like gold and diamond. So you need to have a way to actually put all of this together. And that's what I see the index are doing at a later stage. Wow, that's quite, so, that's yeah, quite for fascinating. Sure. Yeah. It is it is really quite fascinating. What do you think the the benefits to that would be outside of just speculation? Is does this make is it is it a superior storage method? Does it allow more interoperability, more functionality, use cases? Just like, yeah, give us some of your insight to what you think this leads to. I think you can have a lot of on chain games just by having inscriptions and like doing all the heavier parts on like cheaper chains and then just referencing it back to Ethereum and just a complete on-chain game is something that would be really cool. And building, this is more of an infrastructure play is what I look at it. It's not really, I mean, it's not really somewhere that you can just put images. Images is the start of it. Like cat pictures, everyone loves cat pictures. It's better to look at cat pictures than look at DeFi stuff right now. So that's how we started with. But we want to really go to having building games on-chain. I think I inscribed the whole Doom game on the BNB blockchain, and you can go play it right now. And it, you, you can play it flawlessly. We can add levels to the same game. So you, you, you can come to like BNB scription or like even Ethereum, connect your Ethereum wallet, start playing the game, and start fetching assets from other chains, cheaper chains, where we could have stored a lot more. And you can have a complete on-chain game. So this would be like a truly on-chain asset rather than having smart contracts plug into like different off-chain, I don't know, infrastructures to keep score or whatever. So I think that is something that I see where this is going to. I mean, games is just one of it. I also see DeFi having like a lot of a lot of like utility later on, which is like I said, like removing bridges from the from the whole thing. And I think someone's also built a standard for it. I think it's called BRC42. And that is a cross chain. Just through indexing, you could send money from, you could send a BRC20 from Bitcoin to Ethereum. And I feel like that is, that would be really cool. And it has, it's up to these tokens to build utility. For me, it's up to me to build an indexer that is compatible and that lets people do things. I, I'm, I'm not really thinking about how would utility be created to like a BRC20 token or an ERC20 token, EB or C, whatever it's called. I mean, my, my idea is to just build a really good indexer that helps people do whatever they want to do in space. Are you going through this adventure on your own or do you have a team behind you that that's helping I have you build a team. this? I have a team. It's the same team that built Friday Wallet. So I think it was the Saturday morning when I when I was looking at Twitter and then I saw I saw Tom's post that said, hey, these are what inscriptions are. And I looked at it and I was like, wow, this is really simple. Like, why not just build the same thing on like other EVM chains? And then when we built the indexer, I always had this idea of, okay, the indexer is built for Bitcoin, the indexer is built for Ethereum, because Ethereum works from a completely different way of how Bitcoin works. On Bitcoin, it is you write on a Satoshi. On Ethereum, it is you write in like the call data, which is like a memo for like you sending money on MetaMask. So on both of them, it works completely different. The only thing that is common is the indexer. So I do have a team and we we hacked together through the weekend and we built up the first prototype that was BNB scription. Then we were like, okay, the only reason BNB scription, we did BNB scription first because it has a, it has a lot of blocks. Ethereum is much smaller. And so the idea was to build a really good indexer on a much larger chain, because if that works out, we can just port it to other chains. 
other EVM compatible chains. So yeah, I do have a team. We we're working on two projects at the same time. So yeah. Well, it sounds like you're getting actually a lot of joy out of this though as well you are really on the frontier you don't see that many people talking about bnb scriptions polyscriptions arb scriptions whatever comes out next yeah. it's really still in this exploratory phase and there are some some criticisms you know against it about its simplicity or that it's unnecessary right that it's inferior you see like tom the one of the creators of, of eScriptions, talks about dumb contracts right that you know, you're not trying mm -hmm. this, uh, the whole idea isn't trying to compete with ERC 721, 1155. It's to just be supplemental and also an alternative, you know, for, for cheaper fees or just for this simplistic nature. But as you go and build an index and in all these different chains, is there any weak points or is there, is there any type of concern about this growing movement? Like for example, I know EIP, I might mess up this number. I think it's 4444 talks about like wiping out the data from the call data or something of that nature, you know, which is like an existential threat. Do you see that as something that may make this entire mission obsolete or is there any other concerns that you that you've come up against as you've begun to build this out? The first thing that came to mind when I was thinking about BNB description and I looked at the description also I was like, okay, EIP 44s and what would we do then? And at the same time, I found out this language called Huff, which is another smart contract language. So we have Solidity, we have Viper, and then we have Huff. And Huff has this way of storing data on chain, even if call data has wiped out. I don't think so. I, I think we'll survive. E even if EIP 4444 comes out, I don't think so. It's like an existential threat. I think there are a lot of ways to actually do this, even if that happens. <laughs> It's good so, to... so I, I got into this thinking about EIP 4444 first, and then, then I was like, okay, we don't care, so let's just do it. We have other ways to like, get around it, and it'll be fine. Yeah, there, there's always going to be some sort of threat. Like even Bitcoin, uh, with Bitcoin inscriptions or Bitcoin ordinals, this is why Bitcoin stamps were created, because there were there was a fear that the miners were going to... Or, or the node operators were just going to omit all of the, the inscription data, which therefore, right, then it's not on chain and it doesn't therefore exist. On Ethereum, you have EIP, EIP fours, which, you know, could be the threat. But ultimately what I've learned in this space is that no matter what happened or no matter what threats happen, there's always going to be an alternative route to making sure that something succeeds. It's a, it, this entire crypto space is just a, like a game of whack-a-mole. Yeah. <laughs> so I don't think so. EIP 4444 would be like a huge issue. I think it's okay. If it happens, it's all right. But I don't think so. It'll happen. The only thing, the only reason is because someone will have to index all of this data at some point. And if we're indexing it from now, we'll, we have all of the historical data. So we can map it to whatever addresses have done something in the past. That is not a big issue. So even if it does, it, it just states that it deletes data older than a year. I don't think so. We are going to delete data from our storage older than a year. So I think we're good. I think we're good. There. And now when it comes to EVM.inc, how, how do you guys stay alive? How do you make profit? What, what is, what are it, what is it in for you, for the team, for the company to continue to build this and also to make sure that you stay alive because, you know, at the end of the day, capital is the lifeblood of, of, of a business. So what are, what are the plans moving forward? So right now, when we first started off, obviously we're not making a lot of money right now. There are people that are creating collections. Anytime someone creates a collection and it is, if it's not free, people can claim it. We get like a small percentage out of it. But now I think we're moving towards the whole DeFi route and having, exploring liquidity pools and exploring other options that can be done. And I think that is some place that we would make a lot of money from not really right now right now we obviously make no money right now we're just burning money <laughs> we, we're handling two projects at the same time and we're just burning money in one of them so it's all right right now it's just a fun experiment we all of us are like tech guys we all love tech a lot so we're okay with it for now but later on we do see a lot of use cases propping up we do see a lot of more tools coming up like we've seen on ethereum uh, we've seen on bitcoin you have like launch pads that have come up right now and you have like a lot of recursive builders that have come out right now and we think if we just do this in a much better way 
for the whole ecosystem, there is a lot of value. And if there is a lot of value, there'll be a lot of activity. And with activity, obviously, comes money. So that is not something we're worried about right now. Love to hear it. And, and final question is, you know, I'm a, I'm a listener uh, of this podcast. I'm, I'm interested in, in e-scriptions or, or BNB scriptions. What's the best way to get started and the best way to, to reach out to you if maybe there's a request for a different chain or they're just looking for more information on how to participate in evm.inc in the, the kind of inscriptions movement? You can just text me on Twitter. It's on right there. Awesome. Well, yeah. Shardul, I appreciate you for sharing your time with us and for, you know, providing a lot of insight to this, you know, emerging economy that's still very early, really on, on the frontier of these alternative storage options, which ultimately could, you know, make bridges obsolete if your vision does come true of building this decentralized indexer and you get a lot of the movement. So I'm excited to follow along. And I'm excited to have participate and to see where you go with this mission. So really appreciate your time. Thank you for having me. Uh, dude. This was great. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you guys for listening and watching. We'll catch you next time. Yeah.